So today we start a new topic, which is memory management. So, so far in this class, we have been focusing on the CPU. Now it's time to look into other components of the system. And we will be spending the next uh, couple of weeks uh, looking into main now. Uh, memory is def definitely an important uh, part of the computer system. Uh, you know, a program won't run unless it's loaded in memory, as we will see later, later on in, this, in our discussion of memory management, we'll see that we don't have to load the whole program, at uh, least part of it, as we will see later. Uh, but in order for the program to run, it must be loaded in memory. Uh, so, in general, you know, you will have, this is your uh, processor, and this is your CPU, and this is the chip, and on the chip you have, normally you have L1 cache, and this is your main memory. Which is a separate, uh, a separate chip. Uh, usually the access time to L1 cache, and of course on modern systems you have other levels of cache besides you know, L1 cache. So on modern general purpose processors, you have, normally you have uh, L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 cache, three levels of cache. Now the access time to the L1 cache is usually when the, within a couple of cycles. It's like two to four cycles. Within two to four cycles, you can access, or the CPU can access L1 cache. Now, what's the access time for main memory? Yeah, hundreds of cycles. So we're talking about, so this is hundreds of cycles. And so this is two orders of magnitude slower than the L1 cache. And in fact, we have, you know, later on in this, uh, in this course, we will be talking about the disk. And the disk is even slower than main memory. The disk, as we will see, is orders of magnitude slower than main memory. So if we're talking hundreds, of cycles for ma main memory access, we'll be talking about thousands of cycles for accessing the disk. So the disk is the slowest uh, component or the slowest part of the system. So, uh, you know, we will be talking about ma main memory and our, one of the most important objectives is gonna be protection. And the concept of protection, which has nothing to do with security, by the way, so it's uh, uh, protection and security are two, two different concepts. Protection means protecting uh, the operating system itself from buggy user programs that try to access memory locations that do not belong to them. And protecting user programs from each other. So basically, what we want to accomplish is that whenever a program attempts to access a memory location that does not belong to it, that belongs to the, that either belongs to the kernel or belongs to another user program, we would like to block that. And the way it happens is that, as we will see, we need hardware support. So we need hardware support to detect this out of bound or illegal memory access to, uh, to catch that and trap it. And when we say trap, we mean trapping this and giving control to the kernel to handle the, the, the situation. And usually the kernel is going to handle this by terminating the user program that is trying to access to make an out of bound memory access. Okay, so protection is going to be something, it's going to be a very important objective 
of memory, of our study uh, of memory management. Of course, besides efficient use of memory. So our objectives are using memory efficiently and allowing user programs, providing user programs with enough memory to run. But also we would like to, as, a, as an operating system, we would like to, uh, to protect programs from each other and protect the system itself from buggy programs. Now, in our study of memory management, we will start with simple schemes that are unrealistic first. Yeah, so simple schemes that real operating systems uh, do not implement. Uh, why? To study, first to study some of the basic concepts, then to understand why these simple schemes are not efficient. Understanding why the simple schemes are not efficient will justify our study of the more complex schemes that real operating systems use. So we will get to understand you know, why modern operating systems implement more complex schemes than the schemes that we will be studying in the beginning. Oh, so a simple scheme that we will start with is uh, you know, programs are, each program has its own block in memory. So this is the, a memory block that is reserved for the operating system, for the kernel. And then user processes, each user process has its own block of memory. And at this point, each pro process has a contiguous block of memory. It's only, you know, one piece. Each, pro pro each process has a single piece of memory that has uh, the code and the data that uh, this process needs. And each block of memory for each process has its start address and it has its limit. So the base is the start address for that memory block and the limit is the maximum offset that that process has. So if, if a process has you know, memory addresses ranging from 300,000 something to 420,000 something. Then our base is the start address, which is 3,040 in this case. And our limit is the maximum offset, which is 120,900. Uh, and in order to provide protection, we need hardware support. Whenever a program attempts to access a memory address, we need to check, we need hardware to check on the base uh, and the limit. So to check whether this address is greater than or equal to the base. <coughs> if it's greater than or equal to the base, it's valid. It's within the range of that process. And we are fine. But if it's not, then this program is trying to access something that is, uh, that is not allocated to it, something out of bound. And then we tap to the operating system, uh, which means hardware, an exception will get generated, and an exception will get generated, and the control will be given to the kernel. So if we pass, we'll still have to, to check on the limit to see if the uh, if the address is less than or equal or less than the base plus the limit, if yes, then it's legal. If not, then we trap to the operating system. Okay, so this is a simple scheme. Uh, and as I said, the realistic schemes that modern operating systems use are more complex than this, and we will get that to that later. Uh, okay. Now, the concept of address binding, you know, binding, um, uh, binding memory addresses. So, so what do we mean by binding? Well, first of all, if, if you have a, a source file, a program, a code, then your code will have some variable names in it integer x, 
integer y, and so forth. So these are what you have in your source program uh, are variable names. But you know, the compiler translates this into machine code. And machine code doesn't have the notion of a variable name. Machine code doesn't have variable names. What does it have? Instructions. What, what, what corresponds? Something that Address. corresponds to variable names. Yes. Addresses. Yeah, memory addresses and <laughs> registers. Registers. Yeah, exactly. So each variable will be in some storage uh, location, and that variable is either stored in memory, in which case uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> It has a memory address, or it's in a, in a register. So variables are either in memory or in registers. So that's why you know, the, pro, the, the compiler would be translating these variable names into addresses. Now, what kind of addresses? Now, if the compiler translates these variable names into absolute addresses, the actual addresses that will, uh, will be used, this is this will be what we call compile time binding, which is something that modern systems do not do. Compile time binding, it's a concept that we, sh we need to understand, but uh, modern systems do not do. I think this was probably done by the uh, one uh, was done in the DOS operating system with the command.com file, where the addresses in that uh, file are uh, the addresses uh, that. Uh, the corresponding machine code as our absolute addresses. But modern systems do not do compile time binding. Compile time binding meaning generating the absolute address. Uh, what compilers generate normally is relocatable code. And relocatable code means for each of these variables, it will generate an offset. An offset relative to some start address or base address. And when will that base or start address get determined? <coughs> that base or start address will get, may get determined at uh, load time, or it may be determined at execution time. So here, with relocatable code, we will have some offsets, like you know, for x, it's 0, and for y, it's 4. And these offsets. Well, in fact, you know, there may be multiple levels. So these are, these, if these are local variables, then uh, you know, these are relative to the, uh, to the, to the stack frame, uh, or the starting address for the stack frame. But uh, let's not worry about these details. Uh, let's just you know, think of these of, of relocatable code as consisting of offsets relative to some base address. And this base address is either determined at load time or at execution time. So if it's determined at load time, then we have load time binding. If it's determined at execution time, it's execution time binding. Now conceptually, the difference between load time binding and execution time binding is that load time binding means that when the, when the program gets loaded, there will be one base address for that program, and that will not change as the program is executing, or as the program executes. So we just assign a base address to that program, and when it's executing, that base address does not change. While with execution time binding, the base address for a program may be changing as the program executes. Okay, so that's execution time binding. So of course, who will be changing that base address for the program as the program executes? Who will change that? The operating system, of course. So that's because so that it does more, it has more flexibility in doing memory management. Okay. Now, uh, you know, we need to understand the whole process of uh, you know, compiling, linking 
loading and executing. Professor? Yeah. So when you have that base address, is this for a particular variable or is this for the whole program? That's right? Yeah, for the whole program. So everything is relative to that base address. So, so, um, so all the addresses that are in the relocatable code are relative addresses, relative to a certain base. When does that base get determined? It may get determined at load time, so that's load time binding, or it may get determined at execution time. So the, 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 the operating system may assign a base address initially, then the operating system may change that. So why do you need a, a movable base? So is there a limit to how far you can go from that base? Like with integer addition or something. So if you have a program that's pulling from a file at the very base of the disk toward the memory and then at the very end of the memory, is that going to be out of range from each other or something? No, no. no. It's, you need to change the base because the operating system may need to move programs around in memory so that it has more flexibility in memory management. This will become obvious when we look into you know, memory management schemes and why the operating system may need the flexibility of moving programs in memory as they execute. Okay, so let's understand the, you know, the, the compiling, linking, and loading, and execution. So basically we have you know, four stages. There is the compilation, and there is linking, and there is loading, uh, and there is uh, execution. So when you have a program that is written in a compiled language like C and C++, you know, for example, uh, you know, Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Internet Explorer or you know, all of these programs are written in C, C++. So these are written in compiled code. So written in compiled code means that uh, the software developer uh, does the compilation and the linking and gives you the binary, the executable. And that executable gets loaded on your machine. So when you click, when you click on that application, or if you or maybe when you start it at the command line, when you start an application, that application gets loaded. And then it executes. So basically loading and execute loading and execution happens when you run an application first gets loaded, then it executes, while compiling and linking is done by the uh, software provider, by the people or the company that uh, develops that uh, software. So you have, uh, you, if you have a source program, like, you know, program or, or let's call it find one, find one.c, that has C code, the compiler uh, will generate the file one dot obj object file. But an object file is not an executable file. In order to generate the executable, you need to. So this is the executable. You need to link. By the way, you know, compilation and linking are you know, usually done by the same two. You know, like it. I'm not aware of I'm not aware of any compiler that doesn't have a linker with it. So when you say uh, when you use GCC for example or you use Visual C++ or whatever, that's a compiler and a linker. So it has a compiler and a and a linker. And I don't think that there is any compiler that doesn't have a linker with it because without a linker, you will not be able to generate executable code. Uh, so you have file1.c and you have uh, file2.c and the compiler will generate file1.obj and then the linker will take these and form the executable. But in, in addition to linking your own source files, uh, the compiler will link the libraries. So this is something, uh, let's say, uh, something.lib. 
a library file. And a library file will have uh, the functions that your, uh, you know, your program may be calling. So if you have a call to fx, there is a call to function fx. The body of fx will be in a library. So this is the body of function fx. And it's the job of the linker the job of the linker to find the body of function fx in the library file and put it in the executable. So if you are calling fx, so your executable will have the call to fx or, well, since the, so this is machine code, call fx. And then the body of fx will appear somewhere in this executable. So this kind of linking is what we call static linking. Now, you know, assuming that this is, you know, this is for example a program written, written in C or C++ like Microsoft Word, uh, and this is the formation of the executable, so when you get that software, you get the executable, and then you load it and you run it. Now this is what we call static linking because uh, linking the program to this library function happens at link time and it's called static because it's happening before the program runs. So it's something that is done when the software developer does the, uh, you know, builds the executable for you, the executable that you, you get from the software vendor. Okay. Now, the other kind of linking is called dynamic linking. Now, what's dynamic linking? Now, in dynamic linking, uh, you don't link with a... So, this is a static library. <laughs> so, it's a static library, a library that has the code for this function, for this library function in it and you link to it at link time before the program starts running. While with dynamic linking, if this function fx is in a dynamic link library, the executable will not have the body of fx. It will have some information that will tell it how to find fx at runtime. So there will be a stub for fx, something, uh, or in fact, yeah, so a stub for fx, something that tells the program how to find fx at runtime. So basically this will have a name of a dynamic link library. So it will tell it function fx will be available at runtime in some dynamic link library. So, um, and we, we don't have enough space here. Uh, okay, so at, uh, at runtime, okay, so let's put it here. So at runtime, this application gets loaded and it's making a call to fx. Now when it calls fx at uh, uh, at runtime, now it's time to do what we call the dynamic link. So dynamic linking happens at execution time. Uh, what dynamic linking means is that this stop will be used to find fx in some dynamic link library. So it, first it will look for that dynamic link library. It, if it's loaded, then it will use it. If it's not loaded, then it will load it. So this DLL will be somewhere in memory and it will have uh, the body of function fx in it. So the body of fx is in this dynamic link library and this dynamic link library will be at a certain address like, you know, 0x101100. So what dynamic linking means is finding this dynamic link library 
loading the dynamic link library if it's not already loaded in memory, and replacing call to fx with call to you know, 0x110 to the function at address 0x1100. Uh, so this is dynamic linking. So with dynamic linking, the executable for the program does not have the body of function fx in it. It, it only has information uh, about the dynamic link library that has the actual body of function fx. Now, given these, this description, what are the advantages of dynamic linking compared to static linking? Yeah. Uh, your executable is much more lightweight. Yeah, exactly. So one obvious advantage is that the executable uh, the executables will be smaller so the, because they do not have the function uh, bodies in them and what makes this more efficient is that this dynamic link library may be used by multiple programs so if this dynamic link library is a system DLS then many programs may be using the same DLL so if you have uh, you know, 10 programs that are using the same DLL, you only have one copy of function fx in that DLL. There's only one copy, and 10 different programs are accessing that. So it's definitely more space efficient. So it's space efficient. Now, what else? Can you see another advantage? So any updates to the any updates to the code will be reflected at runtime because it's not pre-baked. Sorry. Updates to which code? Uh, the, the library. The, yeah. The non-link library. Right? Yeah, exactly. So this is an advantage. This is an advantage of dynamic <coughs> link libraries. So if there is a more up-to-date version of this dynamic link library, then you can you will get that update whether it's a, uh, whether it's an, an, uh, you know, an enhancement or a bug fix you'll get that update by loading a newer version of the DLL. So now, you know, after purchasing uh, an executable, if something is available in a DLL, you don't need to get a newer version of the executable to get that update. You only need a newer version of the DLL. And some of these DLLs are system DLLs. So, it's, so they're not even part of the... Uh, part of the application software that you are getting. So they are part of the, the system. So updating will be definitely easier, as opposed to static linking. Static linking means that the executable that you have has a certain version of this function fx in it. And the only way to update is to get a newer version of the executable. Uh, now, what's the obvious disadvantage in dynamic linking? Yeah, the obvious, yes, in the back. Slower? Yeah, it's slower, but it's not going to be, uh, you know, too bad. It's not, it's not that, uh, it's not much slower. Why? So, yeah, speed is an issue. So, there is an issue because you will have to load this library if it's not loaded. But, do you expect to load a library with every function call? No. no. So once the library is loaded, it's loaded in memory. And you don't have to uh, reload. And of course, when we talk about paging, we'll see that uh, you know, something, if something is loaded, it will not necessarily stay there because it's, uh, it may get uh, <coughs> you know, uh, swapped to the disk and, and so forth. But uh, the point is that you will not have to load a library whenever you make a function call, uh, a call to a function that is in a dynamic link library. You just load it once, and then you can access it. In fact, multiple programs can access this. Uh, questions? Uh, will, will DLLs be used for like system-specific uh, if the library has to have system-specific calls, will they just 
keep it as a DLL so that every system can have its own version? Or is that typically not going to do What do you mean system specific? Thing? So like if the library is running something that's optimized for, that is supposed to be optimized for each individual piece of hardware, you wouldn't want to statically link it because then it wouldn't. It's yes, yeah, so definitely, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, so if a program is calling uh, you know, a function that is in a DLL, and so on different systems or different platforms, there will be different versions of the DLL. Yeah. Okay. So it's not the same. But also, you know, when you link, when you static link, when you do static linking, again, when you, when you do static linking for a specific system, you get a version of the library that belongs to the, to the system that you are compiling for. So now we have the important concept of logical address versus physical address. <coughs> now in our, you know this, uh, when we have this runtime translation, runtime translation of uh, uh, up, uh, an, an, uh, an address that, is ge that gets generated by an application to a physical address, this execution time translation or binding, uh, this basically maps a logical address into a physical address. And to simplify things, think of the logical address as an offset or as a relative address, an address relative to a certain base. And the physical address is just equal to that relative address plus the base. But the base is uh, the base may change. So who does that translation from a logical address to a physical address? It's a piece of hardware that we call a uh, memory management unit that does the translation from a logical address to a physical address and using a relocation register. And what's the relocation register? It's the base register that we have seen in a previous slide, but we are now calling it relocation register to emphasize that this address in this register may change or may be uh, changed by the operating system. So <coughs> your logical address is, for example, this number 346. It gets added to the value in the relocation register, and that gives you a physical address of 14346, and that's what gets sent to memory. Okay. So what, what the memory management unit here does is adding the value of the relocation register. Now this relocation register has the base address for the current process. The value in here is set by the operating system. Clearly, the instruction that sets this value must be a privileged instruction. So only the kernel has the privilege to change this value so that it can control uh, you know, the base or the start address for each program and so that it can, have, uh, it can move programs around in memory to, uh, to, to utilize the memory uh, as efficiently as possible. So the value here, the base, is in a register that is set by the system by a privileged instruction and this will be, setting this will be part of the context switch. So when, when the kernel switches to a program, it must load into the relocation register uh, the value of the base address or the initial base address for that program. Okay. Uh, dynamic linking, we have explained the dynamic linking. Uh, maybe we did not mention the, 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 that on some systems, uh, you know, they use the term uh, shared library or shared object. So you have uh, the extension DLL for dynamic link library and the extension SO for a shared object. And you see this on Unix systems. You see this on Windows systems. Uh, okay, so
So now let's talk about swapping. What is swapping? Swapping is uh, moving something, moving the memory block that belongs to a program from memory to disk because we don't have enough memory. Now this swapping of a whole program is something that modern operating systems do not do. We'll, we'll understand why in a minute. But let's first show what, what we mean by swapping. Swapping means that this is our memory. We have the operating system and we have this memory. And the system needs to run process number two. Or it's, uh, you know, process number two, it yeah, needs to be run. And memory is full. So we need to make some space available in memory. And the system may do this by swapping out process P1. Swapping out is like, you know, copying to uh, disk. And, uh, you know, of course, the system will need to, uh, you know, to copy only the parts that, well, only if something got updated, but usually it's, there is something that will get updated. So with this scheme that we are describing, which is a very primitive scheme, we are copying the whole uh, memory image of a process from memory to disk. And we are copying, we are swapping in this program, copying from disk to memory. Okay? Now, this is a primitive scheme that modern systems do not use. Uh, why? What's inefficient about this? Why is this so inefficient? Uh, the size of the, the objects being swapped between yeah, exactly. The size is huge. So we're copying the, you know, a memory block, a contiguous memory block that uh, uh, that corresponds to the code and data for a whole program. Copying this to disk is extremely expensive in terms of time. It's extremely slow uh, because, as we said in the beginning, the disk is very slow. So, and uh, we will see how slow when we get to disk management but you know to just just give you some numbers uh, if the transfer rate to the disk is 50 megabytes per second and memory that belongs to that process is 100 megabytes then you need two seconds to copy that from memory to disk or from disk to memory and two seconds is just a huge amount of time in a, in, a, in a computer system. You know, two seconds is something that we, uh, as humans, feel. You feel the two seconds. And something that the, the user feels is extremely slow. Uh, uh, and if, if, the, if the kernel is going to do this as part of context switching, uh, context switching, two seconds is just too much for context switching. You know, we, we expect the context <coughs> switching time to be uh, in microseconds, not in <coughs> seconds. We expect it to be in microseconds. But, you know, uh, you know, one millisecond could be too slow for uh, context switching. Okay. Yeah. So in, this, in general, though, a uh, hard disk transfer rate is probably a lot faster than 50 megabytes, right? Like, uh, well, it depends on the, the system and whether we, we are talking about uh, you know, solid state. So solid state is much faster than the uh, magnetic uh, disks. Yeah, but uh, for a magnetic disk, this is um, you know, typical, but it's not going to be much faster. It's not going to be an order of magnitude faster than this. Yes. On the previous slide, you swapped out process one so that we could run process two. Does that mean process one currently isn't being run and does not have the CPU? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. So the system will have to use a process that is uh, a process that is inactive in order to swap it out. Yeah. So it's uh, and in fact, it will have to take into account if the process <coughs> is waiting for I/O. If it's waiting for I/O then it, uh, the system will try to avoid it 
because if it's waiting for I.O. and the data becomes available later, the system will copy that data from the I.O. memory to the process memory and we want to make sure that the process still has that memory or the process is still in memory before we do the copying. So there are some considerations that the system will take into account before it selects a process for swapping out. Okay. Uh, but anyway, you know, this scheme, basically we're describing this only to understand that it's inefficient. What we will be studying later in memory management is uh, memory management based on paging. And in paging, the, the, the memory block that belongs to uh, a process will be divided into pages, into smaller pieces that we call pages. And swapping will be happening at the page level. So modern operating systems do not swap a whole program. They swap pages. They copy pages from memory to disk to do the management. So management is done at the page level. And swapping a page is much, much faster than swapping a whole uh, program. Uh, OK, so. Uh, you know, standard swapping is not used in modern operating systems, and it may be used if uh, memory is, uh, you know, gets uh, completely, or the demand for memory exceeds the uh, certain threshold.